Welcome back, folks, to actually a very unique episode. I've been looking forward to doing this. I uh, had some thoughts about doing this for quite a while. Welcome to the Legends of Muskie Fishing. We got Mr. Larry Ramsell in the boat today. I... Yeah, for those of you that don't know Larry, this guy probably personally knows more muskies, more about muskies than probably anybody that's ever fished muskies. So I don't, I don't know if I'd go quite that far, but I yeah, <laughs> it's been pretty much my life. Yeah. Yep, I, I bet. You probably know of a few marriages that have been wrecked over the muskie. Including mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, que sera. It's, it's muskie time. Yep. Larry, without a doubt, has been a major influence within the muskie industry for a long time and uh, has written quite a few uh, uh, books on the subject. I've written or co-authored 11 books. 11 books. Wow. <laughs> I actually uh, did a report when I was seventh grade on one of your books on Is the compendium. Right? Yep, That's yep, pretty cool. I've yep. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think I got an A on that on that essay. So All right. I, I, I did. Can see why you're a muskie. Head. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so awesome. Well, what we're gonna try to do is just kind of capture uh, uh, flavor, sights and sounds of what you've seen throughout the years of muskie fishing. The changes. Obviously, you've been an uh, influence to me to go down this crazy route. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, I didn't mean to put that on you. <laughs> but uh, so cool, what an amazing sport. And uh, we're just lucky to have the guys that in the forefront, uh, you know, to pave the way for us. So pretty exciting. Um, we're gonna make a few casts today. Yep. Uh, we're gonna hear uh, a couple stories. Some stories, but uh, maybe a muskie. That's always, uh, it's always a big maybe. <laughs> As we pulled into the water here, uh, he was, Larry was telling us about a 47 pounder, 10 ounce, that was correct? Was it's it 40? About 47 and a half. Right on. <laughs> that was caught uh, casting on this lake, uh, however many years ago. It's been a few years. It's been a few years. <laughs> yeah. but. but there's been big, that size fish caught since then too. Nice. Caught, you know, caught and released. Crazy. Oh, cool. Yes. Sounds cool. like we're on good water. Yep. Got to get cast in. And, Probably uh, the best lake in, in Sawyer County for a fish of that caliber. Pretty cool. Giant. cool. Yeah. <laughs> right on. Let's do this. Let's get let's get chucking a little bit while the sun's still low and see what happens. See what happens. <laughs> oh, here's one. Lazy one. I don't know. It was down really deep. Wow. That was a good one. Really? I mean, it was big down there. <laughs> it was it was deep. Oh, and I hooked my Medusa. Okay, we had a follow. It was nice. That's what I would have set the hook, that's for sure. Fish came in on the old lucky ghost walleye Medusa. It's a stinker. <laughs> First cast on the glider, of course, Mr. The proverbial 21 inch pike has to grab a hold. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, you're probably closer than I am actually. Okay, if this is my only memory of a fish with Larry Ramsell, I'm falling. It has happened right there. All right. On the pelagic glide. They like that little bright guy. That's cool. All right, have a good day. On to the next meal. All right, well, the 1220 update is we saw a muskie. We saw one nice sized muskie. Yeah. Uh, of course, Robbie raised it. Uh, Robbie's got the horseshoe as of late. And as of before too as well <laughs> but uh, hey somebody's got to have it right uh looked like a quality fish on a medusa um <clears throat> just uh i don't know got out of the wind here made a little shallow drift over some weeds caught a little pike caught my first fish with larry so there's a moment in time but uh i don't know let's have a little snack ask a few questions here yeah it's so hard to i mean to think about questions but one question Robbie actually came up with uh, what do you think of the world record muskie? Um, depends on which one you want to refer to there's uh, 
the Hall of Fame's world record, which is Louis Spray's bogus fish. There's the uh, IGFA record, okay. which is yep. Cal Johnson's bogus fish, <laughs> which I'll be crucified for once you air that. And Felt like it is. That's what I like. And then there's the modern day world record, which I'm involved with. Yeah. Which is the 58 pounder out of Michigan, which is very legitimate. I weighed that personally. Oh wow! No kidding. Yeah. After, Not after the fact, and after it had been frozen for four months, it still weighed 58 pounds. Wow. So you know. And how long was that fish? The fish was 59 inches. It That's was a, a It was a beast, and, and it had. Just the skeleton remains of a 13 and a half inch smallmouth in it. No meat, just the, just the bones. Sure. And the head was gone already. And uh, uh, two and three quarter pounds of eggs, or two and a third pounds of eggs. Gotcha. So basically, and it had no water in it or anything else. So it was basically a legitimate giant. Yeah, so. Uh, and then, the of course, we've got the release world record through the Muskie First website, which is the queen that was caught out of Mille Lacs a couple years ago by Dominic Hoyos. Yep. Uh, that fish calculates at 58 pounds, which puts it in a tie with the modern day record. But, you know, it's done by formula, so it's only an estimate. Right, yes. Um, and by the way, the formula, for those of you not familiar, uh, trying to get a, a weight estimate of a fish just by length and girth measurements. Yeah, if, if you want to, if you got a fish over 50 pounds, I've come up with a new formula that's pretty darned accurate. Uh, length by girth divided by 25 minus 8. Minus eight. But that's just for fish 50 pounds and over. If it's under 50 pounds, then it's minus 10. So it's length times girth minus, they divided by 25 minus 10. So one more, yeah, let's repeat that. that that's really interesting. Uh, so, so one more time. Anything up to, f to, four to 50 pounds, length by girth divided by 25 minus 10. Over 50 pounds, you just minus it eight. And that uh, comes very close. I've, I've got a data, database of like 28 muskies that were caught, measured, length, girth, and weighed on a certified scale, scale and released, and or that caliber of fish that was caught and kept. And I've got the, the, the weights, the lengths, the girths, the weights of all them. And from that data, I built this formula. Okay. And it comes out very, very close to, to every one of them. Wow. Yeah, but he's the, talking some real serious muskies. Yeah, handled a lot of these fish. Like that, that's incredible. That yeah. uh, that fifty nine pounder. That's fifty eight. Hey, excuse me, but yeah. wow. Um, so yeah. you know, I I live here in Hayward, Wisconsin, and I get a lot of flack for poo pooing the Hayward records. But let's face it, they're bogus. The uh, Chippewa flowage. No pipe dreams. Memor yeah. I mean. Back in the 1940s, the chip put out two fish that were in the 50-pound class. Okay. And a number of fish in the 40-pound class. But since the 1940s, it's all downhill for the chip. Hasn't been... Uh, Can't been, kill them. Hasn't and, and been a 50-pounder ca caught out of the chip since 1942. So there you have it. Yeah. That's, uh, I mean, obviously a cool body water and well, whatnot. It's, it's very aesthetic. It's beautiful. It's, you know... It's, it's produced some really nice fish, but 69 pounds, 11 ounces, no way in hell. Excuse my language. No, no, no. You can say whatever you want on no, here, man. That, no. That's the great thing about YouTube. So having that said, that, you know, obviously many of the records that, quote, records, uh, were not, in fact, records. Um, how did they get those fish to weigh that much? Well, uh, different ways. Adding weight, of course. Uh, Len? Len Hartman did it by adding wet sand. Um, Art Lawton, I think, probably did it with window sash weights, the okay. old-fashioned yep. windows that had the iron bars in the in the window sills, and it had hung. They were hung by a rope, and that's what when you raised the window, the you could hear them clank down the wall on the okay. inside, and and that would hold the window in place until you pulled it back down again. And those had different weights, anywhere from 10 to 20 pounds, I suppose. Uh, so that was one method they used. Uh, you know, you can put rocks in them, uh, just just water. Yeah. Um, the Canadian record, which is Ken O'Brien's 65 pounder from the Georgian Bay, yes. Moon River. Um, I, I, I personally had that fish in my hands and I okay. personally weighed that fish eight days after it was caught and it only weighed 56 pounds. 
So what I think happened was, and I'm not saying it was done on purpose, but I think in the process of cleaning the fish, they had it hanging from a rope, they hosed it down. And I think like a gallon or so of water got inside the fish. Sure. And that was enough to, to get the weight up there because I did verify yeah. that when they weighed it, they took it from where it was hanging and just moved it directly to the scale. So it didn't have a chance to lay down in the water, run out of the fish. The belly did look artif not, not well, And purpose, I've got a but... series of pictures that shows it from the time it was caught, laying in the bottom of the boat, on the dock, hanging on the stairway where they hosed it down. And then again, later, in fact, I've got a video of it laying in the, in the lake and then a video of it laying on the dock. Okay. And uh, I've got a picture of it laying on the dock, and, and uh, or had laid on the dock, and Ken O'Brien's standing there holding, and that fat belly is gone. And if you look at the dock where it was laying, it's all wet. So that's probably when the water ran out of it. And then from that point, they took it and put it in the freezer. And uh, eight days later, I got there, and that's when I reweighed it. Sure. And that's why I made a point earlier about the 58-pounder uh, out of Michigan that's the modern-day world record still weighed 58 pounds four Wrong. months later after being in a freezer all that time. Sure. It never lost anything. Sure. Whereas Ken O'Brien's fish supposedly <coughs> lost nine pounds in eight days. Yeah, it was it, supposedly 65 It was supposed pounds. to be supposedly 65, and that's what it weighed. It, you know, that's what people who saw it hang on the scale, that's what they witnessed. Sure. But once the water got out of the fish, it, Interesting. Uh, and then froze, and we, you know, eight days later it weighed 56 pounds. So that just proves to me that there was, you know, something in the fish that didn't stay in the fish when it got put in the freezer. And the only thing that could be is water because there was so many people there looking at it. So, uh, you know, like I say, I don't think anybody did anything on purpose. Oh, sure. I just yep. think the water got introduced accidentally. And uh, so basically it was a giant fish. I had no question about that when I held it. But uh, my scale showed it weighed 56 pounds. In fact, I weighed it on two different scales and it weighed the same on both of them. And the length of that fish? That was, was. Uh, and so there was another, another problem. They they claimed it was uh, 58 inches. Okay. There's two different molds in existence of that fish that are, show it just a little over 52. I measured it at 52. Wow. Uh, the throat had been cut, so it was hard to, and it was frozen oh, when I handled. Sure. So it was hard to get an exact, accurate length I measurement. Got it. But. Uh, I had access to a person that was there and measured it fresh laying on the ground and they told me it was uh, 56. So I don't know, but I don't know how they measured it. If they measured it up over the top of the body, you know, you could get uh, you yeah. could get from 54 to 56 pretty quick. So in all likelihood, the fish was in that 54, 55 inch range fresh yep. um, and somewhere around 56, 57 pounds. And that was caught? Uh, what, what was what year was that? 1988. 88, yeah. Oh. I mean, and actually the Ken O'Brien fish we're talking about, that was really one of the first exposures for me personally of, wow, these things get this big, I want one of those. Yeah, well, and that's the, what really got it going for me. Yeah, the problem is they don't get that big, but see, that's, that's where the problem lies with me. It drives me crazy. You've got more mus musky fishermen today than the, than the rest of history put together, probably, thinking that they got a shot at a world record when the, all of the big fish in history have all been bogus. Yeah, yeah. It's Whether really... by a, on purpose or, or, or not. Uh, the, the biggest legitimate fish that I can kind of hang my hat fish. on is, is uh, 61 pounds, four ounces. Okay. And that was caught by uh, Martin Williamson in, in uh, Georgian Bay in, in uh, 2000. Uh, but he didn't get it weighed on a certified scale. He got it weighed on a scale that had been used for trade, but it hadn't been certified for a number of years because he didn't think he had a fish that would have been a Canadian record because O'Brien's fish had already been accepted. And so it probably was a legitimate 61 to quarter pound fish that maybe should be our world record. Wow. So that's why we started the new modern day world record program in 2006. I made the rules so that they, they can't be beat. Uh, you know, the, the fish never gets sanctioned until we actually see the insides of the fish and put it on a scale. Okay.
Cool. So if people want to look a little more further into this, uh, the, the new modern day, uh, what's the best source of that information? We have a website, it's modernmuskyrecord.org, O-R-G, not right. .com. Well, well, of course we'll leave a link to that type of stuff uh, at, at the bottom here. Surely you got more questions. I mean, obviously we could just dive into this and talk for hours about this stuff because, you know, just I think about the sheer man hours that you have put into studying uh. muskies, studying photographs of muskies, um, trying to track down, uh, you know, information on past, you know, fish the, that the were The miles caught. I have driven trying to find details and pictures of, of fish are mind-boggling. I wish I wish I had some of that money now. <laughs> I've spent a lot of money chasing down stories of, you know, and in my latest edition of my compendium, I, I made it two volumes. The first volume was strictly about the world record controversies, uh, and then the second volume was just the fun stuff. Yes. Yep. And that's, that's I spent so much time tracking down that stuff, but that that's the fun stuff. So, so yeah. The ser yeah, tell us a little more about the, the books uh, that you've done and that are, you know... Well, I've, like I say, I've either written or co-authored 11 different musky books. Uh, Bill Hamlin and I did a series of Musky Hunter's Almanacs from uh, 96 to 2000. So that was five of them. And then I've written six of my own. I uh, had my Compendium of Musky Angling History, first edition, second edition, and then the third edition is two volumes, which came out in 2006. Uh, then I wrote a book on the mallow muskie, which was supposedly a 70-pound, four-ounce fish caught in middle of Clare Lake, north of Hayward. That turned out to be bogus also. That was netted in April below the Chip Dam on the Chippewa River. Oh, wow. And uh, stuffed with northern pike and, and ground-up fish meat. And, wow. I mean, it was a giant. <laughs> That's awesome. But uh, it was nowhere near 70 pounds. Sure. Um, Folks, they don't get that big. We are catching. Yeah. The biggest muskies that exactly. are basically and then, right and then the last book i've done is a musky antique musky postcards uh it's it, if you don't like to read it's a great book because it's mostly pictures there's over 700 musky postcards uh in black and white in color from the 1800s through uh, current day and uh 1800s musky postcards yeah like in they, color, they, they, in they, they sent yet. them yeah they mailed them yeah Holy and, and if, if you look through the early history, I've got a postcard collection that's probably numbers in the 3,000 range. A lot of the resort advertising for Wisconsin and Minnesota and, and sure. Michigan in the, I'd say from 1920 through 1960, that was their main main way to advertise. Advertise, yeah. yeah. Every resort would have a, a pictures taken of their cabins or a picture taken with somebody holding a muskie and then they'd put the information on their on the postcard of what yeah. resort on what lake and and the, that got mailed out and that's how they spread the word so it wasn't youtube <laughs> no no there was no <laughs> such those thing young as guys out those there days. yeah so that was the main main way that uh, muskies got promoted for probably 50 years wow so as far as your books go i know you said some of them are a little bit limited availability uh, right now through me but... i don't have much inventory left but uh, all of them are available on amazon Obviously, we'll leave links for all that stuff as well. Um, just the wealth of musky information from from Larry here, I mean, has inspired me, obviously, like we talked about before. I don't want to go on about that, but uh, let's see. What else can we talk about? Uh, what about the Chippewa flowage? Beautiful body of water. Uh, at one time, like any new flowage, put out a lot of really nice fish. But then guys like Spray, who became famous, should be really called infamous, <laughs> started lying about their catches. And, yeah. and I, think it was, I think there was reason for it. It didn't mean as much to people in those days. There weren't near as many musky fishermen. Yeah. Uh, and Louie got his first supposed record in 1939 after making a little money in 1938 off of some bogus fish. <laughs> and uh, of course, you know, the, the war's beginning. Uh, not a lot of tourism going on. He he owned a bar in Hayward. What better way to generate uh, bar business than world put, record muskies? Putting a putting <laughs> a big muskie on ice and having people guess how big it was, and and so he did that in 1939 and 1940, and then uh, 
he kind of retired and moved to Arizona, or moved to Rice Lake and uh, got into real estate. And, and uh, then Cal Johnson supposedly caught a world record in 1949. And Cal had a tremendous reputation as a outdoor writer for 50 years, conservationist. But what a lot of people don't know is Cal was on his last legs. He, doctors had given him a short period of time to live. Uh, we'd just come out of World War II. Tourism in Hayward was nil. Yeah. He had a place here in Hayward. He loved Hayward. So what better way to promote Hayward than a new world record? That's my theory. I can't prove it. Sure, sure. Uh, but the, photo, the professional photogrammetry work that's been done on the fish and the mount uh, proves that it was not nearly as big as claimed. That's probably the kindest way to put it. Mm. It was a big fish, but I'd say maybe a mid 40 pound fish. Yeah. But a, it, it didn't come out of Couturier. It's a, it's a brown and green river fish. Sure. And Couturier's fish are all barred and, you know, different color totally. Right, right. Uh, but I think Cal did it to help promote the Hayward area and knowing he was on his last legs. He, in fact, who would catch a 67 half pound world record and give it away? Yeah. Because that's what he did. The fish is still in Hayward in the Moxon Bar. Uh, sold a lot of beer over the last number of years. <laughs> there you go, folks. You've heard it. Uh, you can run into the doctor. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we're just kind of floating around here. Uh, but uh, I, I think he did it with altruistic reasons. You know, trying to do something good for Hayward before he yeah. passed away. And, and uh, of course, that started the Hayward Muskie Festival in 1950. And, but uh, to get back to Louis Spray, after Cal caught his fish, uh, Cal had won a new car with his I fish. I've heard this, yeah. And uh, Louis sent a telegram, said, don't award the, the prize yet, I'll have a, a bigger fish before the end of the year. <laughs> hmm. And he did. <laughs> Isn't that convenient? Well, professional photogrammetry that's been done on that fish also proves that it's nowhere near as big as it was claimed to be. It was. Uh, both his fish and Cal's fish were enhanced by taxidermy. Yeah. Um, anybody wants to get a hold of me and buy me a beer, I'll be happy to go to the Moxon Bar with them and show them how it was done. You can see, if you know what to look for in the mount, you can see how they did it. Sure, adding skin and whatnot. Yeah, and they added about six or eight inches in total length, and then they added length and breadth to each fin with cardboard and painted it to look like fins. And, you can make as big a fish as you want. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> if you know what to look for, I mean, it fooled me for years. Uh, but then once, I, what really tipped me off is we were at the Chicago Muskie Show, and Ron Lax came over to me. Sure. And he said, there's something wrong with that mount. He said, the fins aren't in the right place. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. And we went and looked at it, and that's how we figured out where they'd cut the fish apart and added a... <laughs> a segment. A segment to make it five <laughs> foot long. Wow. When in reality, photogrammetry shows the pictures from the fresh fish to be about 54 inches. Sure. Give or take. So, such is life in the world of musky hoax. So with all the bogus records out there, obviously those were, uh, you know, a thing of the past and, uh, and still will continue to be all kind of bogus fish. Um, what are some of the waters that, you know, that can legitimately nowadays put out a true 50 pound class fish? Actually, they're fairly limited. And while any native muskie lake that's always had muskies and pike in it together has the potential to produce a world record, the bigger the water, the better the chance. You need an opportunity for a, a fish with the right genetics to live 20 years unmolested to get to that caliber yeah. of, uh, of potential. And uh, Which, obviously- by the way, they can get over 20 years old. Yeah, they can, uh, I mean- there's Knocking on 30, potentially? Well, over 30, I think, because uh, when they aged the mallow fish, they aged it at 33 years, but that was aged by scale, which has been proven to be inaccurate after a certain age because they start losing the outer edge of the scale. Oh, okay. Yep. So they lose some of the rings. The, the scales and the, and the backbone and that, if you would look at them under a microscope, they look exactly like the rings on a tree on if a you tree. cut a tree down. Boom. 
slice. But uh, if you're using the scale, as the fish ages, it loses that outer edge, sure. like the bark in the first two or three rings of the tree yep. falling off. Uh, so you can't give it a good, accurate age assessment. But I'm thinking that if, if the mallow fish aged 33 years by scale, it was probably closer to 36 to 40, somewhere sure. in that range. But that's probably the exception rather than the rule. Uh, the O'Brien fish was 29 years plus or minus a year, and that was done with the Calitherm bone, which is about as accurate as anything you can do okay. to age a fish yep. without having tagged it when it was hatched and, and then following it its entire life. Um, so well, they, they can get quite old, but uh, at a, a, like in Eagle Lake, I caught a, a 44 and a quarter pounder in 1988 that was 21 years old. That was aged, after I, I, I kept that fish, and it yep. was aged by the Calitherm bone, and it was 21 years old. So that, for that weight of fish, that, that's, you know, that's kind of, I think, kind of on the young side. Yes. But then there's the other side of the coin, too, that doesn't happen very often. Uh, Martin Williamson, 61 and a quarter pound fish in Georgian Bay, was only 18 years old, but it was a fish that was not uh, fertile, was not producing eggs. So it was putting all of its energy into growth. Growth, sure. Yep. Interesting. So it was a 61 and a quarter pound fish that was only 18 years old. So, you know, you can have freaks on, on all ends of the spectrum. Yeah, genetics seems to be a, a, a huge, I know we're kind of getting off the subject of, of waters. Maybe, yeah, let's stick to waters a little bit and okay. then we'll tail into to the genetic uh, conversation. But some of the waters, of course, uh, you know, uh, man-made you know wise uh, or you know stocking induced uh, the Minnesota lakes obviously have put out some amazing amazing yeah fish. And, and that's pretty much because of, of stocking yeah um, like for instance Mille Lacs yeah it was always a native musky lake okay but yeah. there was no population that was fishable yeah same thing with Vermilion there's always been muskies in Vermilion but it was a very low population then when the Minnesota DNR started dumping you know, numbers of hatchery fish in there. There was an explosion in both of those lakes and, and a lot of the other lakes that they've stocked uh, along with those and ultimately. So, yeah, Minnesota created probably the best fishery on the planet there for a number of years, as you well experienced. Um, but if because they haven't kept up the stocking, it's on a downhill curve. Yeah. Which which means that you know that water on its own because of the lack of spawning grounds or whatever, uh, it's not capable of carrying that kind of a load uh, without some help from man. Right. So you've got that situation in Minnesota, but you've also got Leech Lake, which has never been stocked and has always produced a number of big fish, but not in the numbers and the size that, that Mille Lacs and, and Vermilion have put out because of stocking. Do you think it had something to do with that first big bang of fish that went into there? Well, any time you stock a, a new body of water or a body of water that didn't have, you know, hardly any population in it, there's always a, an initial explosion. Yeah. Um, they really flourish. I mean, there's no, no competition for them, basically, and, and so they flourish, and, and they've put enough in to, to overcome any more mortality, natural mortality, and uh, so... You well, can, I was you, can, you can create a, a super fishery like Minnesota did uh, yeah. in lakes that were musky lakes but really weren't musky lakes. Sure. You know what I'm saying? Sure. But then you take native waters like the St. Lawrence and the Ottawa River in uh, Ontario and, and Quebec, uh, still putting out giant fish and no stocking going on in the St. Lawrence. Uh, they did stock for a, a number of years the Ottawa River because it had been killed out by uh, pollution from the logging and the dams. Yep. and and so they had to rebuild the fishery. And ironically, they rebuilt that fishery with fish from Chautauqua Lake, New York. Oh, wow. Um, and in Chautauqua Lake, New York, they don't get as big as they get in the Ottawa River. Yeah. And what the, I attribute that to is A, Chautauqua Lake is only 13,000 acres. So it, it, it's not that big. Right. It won't hold a big number of big fish. It gets pounded oh, immersively yeah. and uh, they keep you know they keep stocking from the they, they take them out of that lake they put them right back in that lake so it's a kind of a put and take thing sure so they don't care you know if, if some fish are killed there although serious musky fishermen still let them go um, 
but uh, the Ottawa River was, was recreated. Now, they just did a, a genetic study recently, and uh, what they're finding is that uh, they're finding a hybrid mix of the original genetics and, and some of the Chautauqua genetics, and still in a lot of the, the fish that you're capturing there. But uh, what, they've, what they've decided now is there'll be no more stocking of fish that aren't from there. Sure, okay. In fact, there probably won't be any more stocking, period, because they seem to be self-producing. We catch all sizes, uh, you know, from the little guys to the yeah. five-footers. Um, so. so the Minnesota lakes obviously uh, have the, probably the greatest 50 pound potential they've ever had is probably right now. Probably. Because yeah. that first generation of stock fish have made it to this right. incredible but dinosaur it, You're probably size. also getting to the point where some of the early fish that were stocked there are dying off. Yeah. Yep. If, you know, if they haven't been killed by angler or killed by angling mortality, by, you know, mishandling or, or whatever, uh, they're just dying of old age. Yeah. So and not putting enough more of them in there. I right. mean, that's really the thing, you know, we've kind of tried to do with this YouTube channel is to really raise the, you know, awareness, uh, awareness of muskies. Yeah. And the more people that do it, the more there's going to be research to stocking to everything. Exactly, exactly. And, uh, you know, when you when you do your first stocking, like they did in Mille Lacs and Vermillion, and that, all of the muskies that they put in there are the basically the biggest thing in there at that point, yeah. uh, with the exception of some big pike, but there wasn't enough of those to offset the numbers that they were stocking. But then subsequent stockings are competing with the previous stockings. Sure. So some of those, they are cannibals. They oh, will yeah. Eat, they will eat their Muskies young. will eat their babies. And, uh, you know, so once you get past that first year or two of stocking, all of those fish have a chance to grow big, but then years following that you're going to have some mortality from cannibalism so it's kind of a double-edged sword but it's better than nothing <laughs> so of course uh, Mille Lacs, Vermilion those are you know the obvious two super waters uh, of the Minnesota um, Detroit lakes to a, to yes. a secondary uh, extent uh, they don't seem to quite weigh Right, but they have bigger numbers and as the well. original musky lakes in Minnesota are still good like Cass and Leach yes but they don't put out the numbers of big fish like the stock situations did. Sure. So, and then, uh, you know, Ontario quit stocking a long time ago. So everything up there now is natural reproduction. And then the thing that has really helped the world record potential up there is the 54 inch size limit. If you don't kill them, they get bigger. It's they amazing, got, yeah, folks. They, 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 can't, they can't grow if you knock them in the head. It's a pretty, <laughs> pretty simple philosophy. So, yeah, and... Uh, you know, Michigan, uh, unfortunately, they still allow spearing there, which, you know, wow. once they stick a spear in them, they ain't not going to grow any bigger. What year is it here? Just come on, people. Yeah, yeah. I don't uh, get it. It's just, it's a it's a traditional thing with the spears yeah. in Michigan fighting the DNR. And you know how that goes sometimes, but uh, there are a number of native muskie lakes in Michigan that have, have the some super giant Great Lake strain of fish. Uh, in one particular chain, they've been isolated now from the Great Lakes by dams. Okay. But the original genetics are still there. There's not a real big population, but as proven with the modern day world record, the 58, 58 pounds is a pretty darn good fish. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's not a lot of them there, but there's still some giants there. The genetics are there. Yes. Yeah. Um, you get into the southern lakes, you get into a lot, lot longer or a lot less longevity because. Their, their season is so much longer, the fish burn out. They, they don't have the cold, right. dormant season like we have up here to allow fish to grow 20, 25 years. Whereas down there, the, the average is probably 12, 13 years, maybe 14, 15 on the upper end. Sure. And then they burn out and they die. They grow so fast, they just... Like Cave Run has produced right. some 40 pound class it's fish. It's produced 50 pound fish. but very few and you know right at 50 pounds and that's it and if you knew the age of that fish it was probably 15 years old or less that's wild so yeah. it's just it was one of those <clears throat> genetic freaks that grew faster than the rest of them and and made it to 50 pounds before anybody caught it and before it died sure there's probably 50 pounders dying every year down there that just ain't getting caught sure so what about Green Bay that's kind of an interesting yeah deal Green, there. Green Bay again is a situation what I compare with Minnesota 
it's always had muskies. Um, you know, pollution and and whatever in the 1800s, and that pretty much killed out a fishable population. Yeah. Um, tributaries there, like Butamore and Winnebago, uh, it's had muskies forever. forever. Yeah. But again, not a big population. Well, then when they started stocking Green Bay, thanks to the Packerland Muskie Club and a lot of effort has been put of, in there. A lot of effort, a yes. lot of money, and then of course the DNR getting on board. Uh, created a, a similar situation to uh, to Minnesota. Uh, a lot of big spotted fish that like to eat. Oh yeah. <laughs> that's what you gotta love about the spotted fish. They, they love to eat. Uh, that, that's they, an interesting. They have to eat. Let me clarify that. Okay. They grow so fast they can't stop eating. In other words, a, a, a 30 inch Wisconsin fish can be anywhere from four to six years of age okay. on an average. Those, those spotted fish at 40 inches are the same age. Okay. 38 to 40 inches. Fun fact. So guess how they got that much bigger? By they, eating more. Eating more. They so to, they are easier to catch for that reason. They are easier to catch because they eat more. I've always said that and yes. people thought I was stupid. No, no, you're right on the money because these fish have been here forever yeah. and they don't grow that fast. That's the way their genetics have set up over 10 to 12,000 years that they've been here. Different kinds of lakes. Right, and so they don't, they don't, and, and like a friend of mine says about Moose Lake, those fish, the big fish there, there are a few, but they're so smart because they've been there for 25 or 30 years. Sure. They don't make but one mistake a year if they make any. They're not 10 year old adults, exactly. they're 22, 24 year old adults. Or even older, so sure. they don't eat like the spotted fish do. The spotted fish, they've got to eat to grow. And they do grow. I mean, they'll grow to, I know of a situation in western Wisconsin where they stocked the Leech Lake spotted fish. They grew to 38 pounds and 54 inches in 10 years. A Wisconsin fish be lucky to be 40 inches in 10 years. Right, yep. So that's, that's the genetic difference. That's, and that's what makes me crazy that the DNR won't at least utilize some of that situation in lakes where they can't escape or, or uh, lakes that weren't musky lakes to start with. Well, what give, I found give interesting. Give fishermen something they want. What I found interesting is before they impl uh, implanted the 54 inch size limit on Green Bay, they were like, oh, we don't even know if they're gonna get this big. Well, and part of that problem was that you had so many hundreds of guys living in Wisconsin that had never caught a 50 incher in their entire musky career, yeah. some of them 25, 30 years, they go to Green Bay and they catch a 50 incher and boom, knocked it in the head. And numbers of them, yeah. I heard a yeah. number well, of yeah, people. The, the first few years that they started showing up at 50 inches, most of them died yeah. because they got whacked in the head. Yeah, they were trolling right off Kidney Island in October, November, and they were they were just yanking 50, you know, legit 40 pounders, they were thumping them. Yep. Oh, I just need my one for the wall. Yeah, well. How many, a fake how many guys can take their fish for the wall and have a fishery left? Yeah. So thank God uh, saner heads prevailed and right. catch and release really took hold and, and that's what saved Green Bay. Well, what's interesting to me about Green Bay, which is where I've probably seen the biggest fish in my life, um, is that there's so much water that is not even being touched at oh, yeah, all. Yeah, it's crazy. At all. It's crazy. The open water fishery has not even been explored yet yeah. out there. Granted, needle in the haystack, but you know once you find them, you got they're going to be mine. grouped up somewhere. Yeah. Muskies are, once you kind of find what they want, they're almost so simple to really pick apart where they're going to be. Except in places like Eagle and the lake trout lakes of northwestern Ontario. Those fish are a totally different animal. I don't care what anybody says. They feed in deep water. Most people aren't fishing in deep water. You see them when they're in shallow water, but they're not eating. Sure. I mean, okay. once in a while you might surprise one or they're done digesting and they're going back out to the... When I did the tracking study on Eagle Lake, I found that they were feeding in water 30 to 50 feet deep, Cisco's mostly. Yeah. And then going back to the shallows, which was almost 10 degrees warmer than where they just got through feeding. Now, basically my theory there is they were warming up speeding up their digestion and then going back out and do it again. In July I had a 54 inch female, 40 pound female, that made a 10 mile circle from deep water to shallow water every three days the month of July. Every three days she traveled 10 miles. 
this folks this is radio tracking there's a transmitter inside these fish they can't hide That's, from you that, yeah. how many fish have you transmitted and studied we had 10 in eagle lake and we had 10 in wabagoon lake wow monitor the exact uh routes i mean they couldn't hide from me they thought they could but they couldn't and i could you know once i got used to the equipment i could pick them up from a half a mile away if they were high in the water column sure okay if they're deeper in the water column i had to get a lot closer to them but once we learned where they were spending their their home range time and i i think truly that they have two different home ranges they have one which is their feeding home range yep. in deep water particularly in eagle uh, and then the shallow water place where they go to warm up and digest and it's a much much smaller area which is where we fish which is most where you of the fish time. most of the time and i had occasions where i could pick up the the big gal in the shallows where she was sun shining and I, one day i went out about two o'clock in the afternoon I, I picked her signal up and I, but i couldn't see her because the sun was in my eyes so i, I went inside the, right into shallow water almost too shallow for my electric motor and got behind her where the sun was behind me and i could see her laying there sure a big yellow eye about size of a silver dollar looking at you just sun tanning and still I had a single hook uh, spinner bait that I pinched the barb on so I wouldn't hurt them and I, I cast it out and I run it past her nose and she never moved I cast it out again and I ran it right into her nose she moved 50 feet and stopped she wasn't gonna leave the area yeah she was there for a purpose and that was to warm up and digest comfort and she would follow on a, an occasion she would follow a bait sure. but she never the whole summer never touched a bait so often folks i've you know when this study came out like i when i that was when i first really started going to canada musky fishing i pretty much tailored my day-by-day -day fishing activities based on this somewhat i tend to fish more main lake and rock spots during cloudy conditions and you know when fish were maybe more likely to feed and when, then and when you were right there because you were in their feeding area, even though you were on points maybe closer. Sure. But you weren't in the weed beds where no. where we think we need to be on a cloudy day. But yeah. it was days like this, bright sunshine. That where, they were in the I would, shallows. I would find them in the shallows. There you go. That's, I mean, he tracked them right where they were. The yeah. Days like today, boom, they were in the, in the you know, the slop and that, whatnot. That's why we came in this weed bed. Exactly. Yeah. Just to see if there was anybody laying in there. So, so, so Green Bay, obviously that's... Uh, one of the you know one of the waters that you could seriously catch a, a monster oh, yeah and there's no doubt fit a, a, a number not a lot but I'd say a fair number Enough. of 50 pound fish there yeah I mean they, they don't stop growing when they get to 45 pounds if they have the genetics and you know all the fish that they stocked were Great Lakes strain fish so they should all have the, the potential what about St. Clair St. Clair's Great Lakes fish it's just they you know, they came in from Lake Huron through the St. Clair River and they go out to Lake Erie by the, the Detroit River if they don't stay in St. Clair. But St. Clair is a little unique in that it's 330,000 acres of spawning brown. Yeah, it's It's wild. just one giant spawning bed in nursery. That's why they call it the musky factory. Exactly, it because is. that's what it is. It's a musky it's factory. It's the greatest ever. And the, the, the thing that has started showing up bigger and bigger fish in St. Clair is because people finally started letting them go. When I fished there in the 70s with Homer LeBlanc, every boat that went by had a 20 pounder hanging on a stringer off the side of the boat. We talked to two stringer. guys, that, we had two guys that he had trained to fish that we talked to at two o'clock in the afternoon. They had their Canadian limit and their Michigan limit of six and they were going back to the dock. We got them folks, all we got them yeah, today. And they're all dead. Wow. Well, once that stopped, yeah. once the catch and release caught on, and it took longer there than just about anywhere else. Uh, that's why St. Clair is what it is today. And what about, I thought the VHS pay, uh, maybe played a role. It, it played, in, a, uh, played a paid a role in getting more fish to a bigger size quicker yeah. because they had a chance to eat more. Less competition, more to eat, boom. Yeah, yeah I mean, some of the top guides I talked to over there, they were catching half the number of fish, but they're catching a lot more big fish. Man, there's, yeah, so the one we got last fall, uh, I caught was my first 50 of the year finally that was in December that was a 50 incher that was I mean it was a butterball that was a monster fish yeah. Yeah, that's, a, that's the heaviest fish of the year the, the, the place that probably going to break the record is a place that there's no closed season like St. Clair or <laughs> yeah, like St. Clair now hooks right. I, I think isn't it catch and release for part of the year um, or is it 
or one a year. I guess you can only keep one a year. Sure, sure. Yeah, something like that. But uh, like, like I know some waters out east that uh, the season runs all the way through the winter up till 31st of March. Well, obviously when it's froze, you can't fish. Right. But the minute the water opens up, I've got friends that are out there Letting hard at it. <laughs> I had a friend of mine caught a 50 inch 50 pounder. 50 March, inch March 50 31st. Pounds. Guess that fish was full of eggs, huh? Wow. <laughs> You know, maybe it's not the best thing for the fish beating up on them when they're full of eggs, but you know, you're not going to catch. They all are in the, the fall too. Yeah, you're not, you're not going to catch all the fish in the river anyway. So, well, we've managed to hear just a little snippet some of the stories <laughs> and uh, uh, the follies that have gone on in the musky world and what it was like uh, to get going and whatnot. Um, we raised a musky. We're gonna let's go, go we're back gold, to we're this golden. musky. Yeah, we're gonna go back here and catch that dirty bugger, folks. We purposely chose a body of water, deep, clear, uh, bit known for bigger fish, uh, so we would not have a bunch of action, a bunch of interruptions exactly. from muskies. We had talking to do. So, but uh, we're gonna go back on this fish we raised this morning. Weather change is looking juicy. Uh, it's looking good. So I don't know. We'll give it a couple more uh, hour and a half or so here of casting and then we'll go from there. Well, no muskies, but we kind of figured that this is a trophy body of water, clear water, tough lake. Yeah, we were after nothing but big fish. Yeah. They don't want to eat the heck with them. Exactly. <laughs> we had a big front moving in, but just awesome to hear all these stories the from Larry. about six hours late. We were <laughs> yeah. dumb this morning. Right. Yeah, maybe then we'd be on them. Yeah. Guaranteed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, no. We did raise a fish, so yep. that's uh, awesome on a body of water like this for yeah, sure. It's gin clear on a bright sunny day. Right, saw one. Not real. Not real happy one, but it, it, really it was kind of curious. At least got it to look. Exactly. <laughs> At any rate, this has been a truly unique uh, experience I've been looking forward to, to be able to spend a day in the boat with, without a doubt, probably the one of the best musky historians uh, that's you know ever uh, told the story right. of musky the, fishing. The real stories. Yes. If you want, that, yeah, that's yeah. made a lot of people unhappy. They don't like the truth. Yeah. yeah. The, the truth hurts the sometimes. The truth hurts. Yeah, it sure does. <laughs> You know, I was a spray believer for years, even when I moved up here. Yeah. I had, you know, world record waters. Right. Because I was guiding on the chip. Yeah. It's just not real. It just wasn't real. <laughs> when I realized it wasn't real, I said it wasn't real. Right. That's one thing some of the people around here refuse to do. <laughs> That's yes. what it They makes. know better and they just, they're being hateful about right. it. Right. Well, I have the utmost respect for you, Larry, and what you've done. This has mm -hmm. really been an honor for me to get to do this. Um, Thank you. It's been fun for me to join with you guys, too, absolutely. from what you guys have been doing lately. you got the hot hand going. <laughs> it's been fun. It's definitely been fun. Uh, this is the first of this uh, series. We hope to continue the uh, legends of musky fishing. We're going to hope to get out to with a few other legends yeah, in the sport awesome. of musky fishing. But, um, um, we're going to leave all of Larry's links in below. If you want to get some of his books, um, all that sort of stuff, if you want to learn more about the history, he's got a lot. It's just it's it's mind blowing what he has written down. It's absolutely crazy. Yeah, it blows my mind. <laughs> it took me three months, eighteen hours a day, seven days a week to write volume one of my third edition. Wow. And That's... then it took him another month, eighteen hours a day, seven days a week to do volume two, which I didn't have to do a lot of new work in that. Right, one. right, so right. That was a lot easier. So four months of my life went down the drain so, with volume three. <laughs> Not to mention uh, how many years of casting. Exactly. So 64. <laughs> 64. I just happened to know. Gotcha. <laughs> At 78 years old. Be 78 next March. Still casting the rubber. <laughs> we all hope to be doing that. That's for sure. No kidding. It ain't easy though, folks. <laughs> it ain't easy. <laughs> well, thank you so much for watching this very special episode. Uh, look forward to the next time we can share a boat together. Hopefully uh, you'll want to come out with us again. Absolutely. Maybe. Uh, even though we were jinxes today, but we'll find uh, some secret places to go to. Absolutely, let's I do that. I know a few. <laughs> All righty, I believe that. Uh, until next time, thank you so much for watching this. Please go down, click the subscribe button. That would be awesome. And we will catch you on the next episode. <laughs>